All right, so um, my name is Chris Chichi Mori, and I'm coming to you on Facebook Live on April 16th. I'm hoping for a sound check and to make sure that the video's coming across well. And I've got a uh, So if anyone can hear me and see this video, uh, please put a comment in the, um, the comment screen. Okay, yay, great. Um, so I wanna thank everyone for being here. I'm trying to figure out, yay, hi. <laughs> I see some people I know commenting. Um, please feel free to leave a comment with uh, where you are at home. Um, again, this is Chris Chichi Mori, Curator of Collections from McKissick Museum at the University of South Carolina coming to you from my home in Columbia, South Carolina. I am uh, excited to be participating in our first Ask a Curator event on Facebook Live. Um, just a few things about um, how this can go. If you have a question, please go ahead and post them in the comments. Um, I'll see them and uh, we'll try and keep up as we move along. Um, I do have some, some questions that were submitted ahead of time. And um, let's see, shout out to Columbia, I see, and Fort Mill, hello. <laughs> um, so for those of you that do know uh, about McKissick, we are the University of South Carolina's um, repository and serve as a museum for the university. Um, our mission is to tell the story of Southern life, uh, which would include um, nature, material culture, as well as um, university history. So we tell the story of Southern life, culture, community, and the environment. Oh, hi, Laura from Rock Hill. Good to see you. Um, so McKissick was created in 1976. So as museums go, it's not incredibly old. I'm just about 45 years old. Um, but the collections date back much longer. And um, the earliest collection that came to the university uh, dates back to 1822. And those are largely our mineral collections that were sold to the university by the Thomas Cooper, who was at the time the president of South Carolina College, which is now uh, University of South Carolina. And um, so in the last almost 200 years, uh, we've really grown that collection from more than just a mineral collection, but to also include um, other natural history specimens, fossils, we've got some taxidermy, a large collection of shells, but also um, material culture. Uh, and this is a term that can sometimes be confusing. Material culture includes really anything that is man-made. So it could include something like my mouse. It could include a pen, a glass, a cup, pottery, um, all kinds of uh, anything that's man-made. Chairs, buildings, cars um, could be considered material culture. And in that respect, McKissick really focuses um, on <clears throat> uh, large collections of pottery, especially 19th century pottery from the Edgefield region. Um, we have a large sweetgrass basket collection. Uh, we also have an extremely large collection of uh, political memorabilia. Um, but we also collect art that was created by faculty uh, here at the university and other art representative of South Carolina. Large textile collection, including quilts. We've got a quilt exhibit um, up right now. Of course, you can't see it. 
but <laughs> we've been sharing a lot of pictures about the quilt exhibit coming along. Uh, a large collection of uh, silver and hopefully we'll be uh, putting some more uh, images of our silver collection up on, uh, on Facebook as well. So uh, hi Alyssa, good to see you. I hope you're doing well in uh, Washington, DC. And uh, Sharon, good to see you from Florence. We love all the posts and that you share and help us get uh, some more uh, exposure on Facebook with their City of Florence Owls. And oh, I see Hillary, good to see you and Elizabeth. <laughs> um, thank you all for joining us today. Um, and uh, finally, another collecting area of uh, McKissick is um, we really focus on folk life and we house the Folk Life Research Center, which is an archive of um, videos, images, uh, audio recording files of um, folk life from the Southern region. This is not just specific to South Carolina, but we really focus more on uh, the South, the Southern region. Um, all right, so I see a uh, shout out to a lot of uh, friendly names. I guess I can't see faces, you can see mine. And I'm wondering, does anyone have any questions yet? I uh, can start with my list here. Um, I know we may have uh, some members of a sixth grade class joining us for extra credit. So yay, get some extra credit, always a good idea. <laughs> So um, one of the questions that was posed earlier was, um, how do we keep everything organized? When I talk about um, all of the, the minerals, the, the material culture specimens, how do we keep everything organized? Well, um, what we do is we create records in an, uh, a database that is computerized uh, prior to that. Um, all of our records were kept on, on catalog cards and a thumbnail size picture would be stapled to that catalog card and we'd have to know the number of something and flip through. Um, so having a compu computerized database is of course much easier. We can uh, search through this database by keywords or by people. Um, we can attach very large images to uh, the records in the database. And um, we currently have just a hair under 30,000 records in the database. However, we have many, 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 many more records to add, and that will, will likely be an ongoing process. So um, that's how we keep the, the records organized. But how do we keep things organized in, in the building? Well. Um, when someone donates something, we, um, we document everything we can about it in the record and we put a number on the object and um, it's usually a, a very small <laughs> number. Uh, we'll go back to my mouse here. We might put it on an inconspicuous area here. And um, that number is then associated with the record. So as far as physical organization, we try and keep like things together. So like all the mineral specimens in one room, everything that's made out of metal in another room, all the baskets in another space, all the textiles in another space. And that will help us maintain um, good temperature and humidity and specific environmental conditions for those types of objects. Um, it gets tricky when you have something called um, objects that are considered compound objects. So something will say perhaps a firearm that might be made of wood and metal, then we have to um, take care of it um, according to the most sensitive type of material that it's made out of. All right, so let's go to another um, question. Anything there? So what's in the back? <laughs> Um, this is uh, a question that, that really a lot of people are, are interested in. Um, this is pretty much why people come to behind the scenes tours to see what's in the back. And um, it's often uh, one of the most exciting parts of what goes on. Um, I think I mentioned something on Facebook the other day about the glamorous life of being a museum curator. And it often is more weird than glamorous. Um, I have found myself vacuuming 
alligators and um, rolling quilts and, um, you know, just doing some strange things I never thought I would do <laughs> ever. But um, these days, uh, we, what's in the back? We, we keep, uh, most museums can only exhibit about 1% of their collection. And um, McKissick does fall into that category, 1% or, or possibly even less. Uh, we have more collection space than uh, exhibit space. So um, we often keep, um, if you were to just open the doors to the collection, you would see just most likely cabinets, uh, which is not all that exciting. But once you open the cabinets and look inside all the drawers, um, that's where we keep uh, many, many minerals. Um, and again, trying to store like things together. Um, as the curator of collections at McKissick, it's really my responsibility to um, be mindful of, of how all the type, different types of collections need to be stored, what their um, specific needs are, and uh, how we can steward them in a way that preserves them long, long, long into the future. And when we think about um, the history of McKissick's collection, remember I said the first collections came to the university in 1822. Um, so these collections at the time were housed in um, a, a building, uh, I believe Longstreet Theater on the University of South Carolina's campus. And then when the Civil War broke out, those objects were literally thrown out of the building um, so that it could be used as a hospital. And um, professors ran around and picked up the mineral specimens, uh, kept their labels with them. And we still have those same labels and minerals here today. So that's kind of a success story of what museums do. And I, I feel like it's, it's my responsibility to continue um, in that vein and keep uh, the documentation with the, the objects and specimens long into the future. So um, let's see. Here's one. Um, how did I end up at McKissick? Well, um, I originally trained to become a paleontologist. Um, so I learned how to take care of fossils, glue them back together, collect them out of um, out of the ground. I think you'll see behind me right here is a fossil of a, an ammonite, kind of a an ancestor of squid or octopus. They lived in a shell. But um, so uh, I got a master's degree in paleontology and um, worked for quite some time at Clemson as a curator of education for 12 years. And when uh, my husband became a curator of natural history at the State Museum, we moved to Columbia and um, I was able to get a position at McKissick working on inventorying the mineral collection. And um, I was uh, fortunate enough to remain uh, at McKissick for quite some time in a part-time fashion as the curator of natural history here. And when the curator of collections position opened up, I applied for that and am now full-time. So um, in the meantime, after learning how to work with fossils, I uh, really did everything I could to learn how to take care of everything else um, so that I would be uh, much more marketable and um, really build the skill set of taking care of things more than just rocks, minerals, and fossils, but to also include um, textiles, art, uh, glass, ceramics, and um, I'm still learning. <laughs> it's probably a, a never ending process. I, and that's kind of what keeps me going is learning more. There's always more to learn. All right. Nobody's posting any questions. Give me some questions. I'll keep going back to my list here, though. Uh, let's see. Here's one. Uh, do I have a favorite piece in the collection? And 
I don't know. <laughs> that's um that's a really hard one for me. Uh, however, if forced to ask, I'm going to go with um, an inkwell. Um, this is Thomas Cooper's inkwell, and I think I'm going to try to uh, copy a link so that you can see it. Copy. And, hmm. Oh, there's a question. I'm sorry. I'm finding it now. in your collection and if what what's the largest one okay so i'm gonna get back to your question in just a minute sharon um here is a link to the inkwell that i was uh, referring to this inkwell is um belonged to thomas cooper again second president of south carolina college now university of south carolina and um he, what I like about this specimen is that um, we actually have uh, a silhouette of Thomas Cooper uh, sitting in a rocking chair and um, you can see the inkwell is actually on a table right next to him. So we have the inkwell and the silhouette of him that features the inkwell. But the University of South Carolina also has hundreds and hundreds of letters that he wrote. And so I like to think that this is a specimen that really um, encompasses a lot of different areas. Um, he might have used this inkwell to write labels for the minerals that we have in our collection, but he also used this inkwell to, um, when he was writing his displeasure with certain presidents, <laughs> um, he was documenting what was going on here at the university at the same time. So, so there's the inkwell and that seemed to work. Let me see if I can get you a image of the silhouette as well. Here's the silhouette coming. All right. So Sharon has a question about, um, Holly's Island shells. Do we have any of these in the collection? And if yet, if yes, what is the largest one? She thinks they're called Venus Imperial. And um, we do have a lot of shells in the collection, um, just over 5,000 um, seashells. Many of them are um, historic and were collected during the mid to late 19th century by a man named uh, Lewis Reeves Gibbs. Um, Gibbs is one of the historic Southern naturalists that we've been documenting and digitizing collections of in partnership with other institutions here at the University um, Digital Collections, South Carolina, but also the Charleston Museum. Um, so to answer your question, we do have some Venus clam shells, yes. However, we don't have any that are incredibly huge. I, I know these Venus clamshells get real big. Ours are in this neighborhood, we'll say size of a grapefruit. But I, um, the rest of the shell collection is has not been cataloged into that online database yet. <laughs> and so um, that's something that we're still working on. But um, I would love to see a picture of a Venus Imperial that that you might have. So um, if you want to um, snap a shot with your your cell phone and go ahead and put that in the comments. We'd love to see that. All right, I think I have another question. Uh, hi, Chris. Uh, looks like what would I like to see added to McKissick's collections? Hmm, <laughs> that's an incredibly, <laughs> that's a complex question. <laughs> um, wow, what would I like to see added? You know, because I come from a natural history background, we have very few dinosaur bones <laughs> um, and they were all collected from Wyoming. And so it would be nice <laughs> if we had um, some dinosaur material from South Carolina. Now that's, that's of course tricky because we don't have a whole lot um, of dinosaur material from this state, but uh, I'd like to see a, a little more fossil material here in the collection. <clears throat> so I guess that's something we can work on. 
Uh, <laughs> all right, Mrs. Sessions, sixth graders, uh, want to know what's the big deal with quilts? Well, <laughs> that's that's a great question. Um, quilts are are something that really have had an interesting history. If you think of um, quilts can be very utilitarian, they can be made just to, you know, cover your bed and keep you warm. Um, but then again, um, when people are creating quilts, um, the first thing they do is often, you know, choose some fabrics that are in patterns that kind of go together and they choose a pattern that they want to make, a, a sh the shapes that make up the designs of the quilt. And I think for a long time, um, making quilts was not only um, a fundamental thing uh, that, that people had to do to have something to keep them warm, but also it was a way for uh, many people, most often women, to kind of um, demonstrate their skills as artists in um, putting different fabrics together, um, but also a way to show off their needlework skills as well. Um, early on, it was important for women to um, create samplers and needlework to, you know, prove that they would, uh, that they had these, these good skills. So quilts were another way of um, showing off needlework skills that also was something that was very fundamental. You can probably see right behind me is a quilt that um, that my mother made. And, and this is, this is a wall hang hanging quilt. It's not something that would keep anyone incredibly warm, but um, she knows how I love impressionist paintings. So there you have it. <laughs> um, let's see, we've got to um, another question. Also, you vacuum alligators? Well, yeah, we do. <laughs> um, as the curator of collections, uh, it's important to uh, make sure that everything we have on exhibit is is um, stable and in a, a, a good um, it's not getting dusty or dirty and so um, I make regular rounds throughout the museum checking temperature and humidity and we also um, have traps I may have you may have seen in a post that I made yesterday I we check pest traps so we have sticky traps um, that will let us know. Um, we just check them probably once a week, once a month, and they'll alert us to um, any types of animals that would then, you know, any types of insects that would be damaging to the collection. Um, and at least once a year, we do try and vacuum the taxidermy um, just to make sure that uh, no dust has been settling in and we have a alligator on the ceiling. <laughs> in the natural history collection. So I I had a picture of it, but I'm not sure how to post that now. Perhaps I'll be able to add it as a comment, a picture of me vacuuming the alligator. All right, um, Linda wants to know what my favorite dinosaur is. Um, good question. <clears throat> While I am a paleontologist, I will admit that dinosaurs are not my collection, my, my specific um, area. I'm a vertebrate paleontologist who focuses in Ice Age um, mammals, so things like saber-toothed cats and giant ground sloths. But I do have a favorite dinosaur, and that's the Stegosaurus with the big plates on their back. All right. <clears throat> so Paul has a question. If you had a new room added to the museum, what from the collection would you most like to put on exhibit? Oh, this is an easy one. The Royal Governor's Chair. <laughs> Sorry, State Museum. I would really love um, to have a, a place to exhibit um, the Royal Governor's Chair that we have. Um, it was made in 1739 and it's one of the few colonial art objects we have. Um, it was donated to the museum in the late 19th century, I believe, and um, repaired in the early 20th century. 
Um, it is currently on exhibit at the State Museum. It's been on a long term loan there. Um, so you can see it, <laughs> but um, it would be nice for this kind of uh, very interesting, very um, old and important piece of furniture to come back to McKissick, perhaps someday. All right, Hillary, hi. Um, where do most of the museum objects come from? Um, well, as with many museums, um, most of our objects have been donated to us. Um, occasionally, we have funding to purchase objects. However, um, especially in this current situation, um, it's unlikely that we'll have copious amounts of uh, funding to, to purchase objects in the near future. And so we really rely on our uh, friends, members, and donors um, to kind of alert us to objects that might be coming available or to make those objects, um, donate them to the museum as a, a, for tax deduction or to bequeath them to us in their wealth. Um, we're very grateful for um, the thousands of uh, generous folks in the past who've helped us build uh, such a large, important collection. All right, let's see. Hannah, hi. How do you decide what topics to create exhibits for and when they'll happen? Well, <laughs> that's uh, another very good question. We, um, we really uh, try and work on a two to three year plan for exhibits. And um, we come together uh, four or five times a year and discuss exhibits that have been proposed to us, either from other individuals, sometimes they come in from um, internet links. Um, occasionally, uh, sometimes we come up with ideas of uh, permanent collection exhibits to put together. Uh, sometimes we have uh, student classes that want to work on exhibits and uh, uh, what we typically ask people to do is to go to our website and fill out an exhibit proposal form. We're looking for kind of, you know, a big idea, some, some thoughts and comments of how a group of objects um, can tell a story. And really that is um, what a material culture kind of curator um, would do uh, when they'll happen. Uh, and that can, when, they're, when an exhibit um, can happen, really can depend on um, how extensive the, the object list might be, if some of those objects might need to be borrowed from um, private donors or other museums, um, in which case we'd have to coordinate um, with a lot of different moving parts um, McKissick is um, also, as uh, the home of the Folklife Resource Center, our chief curator of folklife, Sadler Taylor, um, curates an annual exhibit, and those exhibits all have something to do with Southern folklife. Um, this year, our exhibits focus on quilts. Uh, the previous year, they focused on the pottery of Thomas Chandler, We've also done exhibits on uh, furniture made here in the South, on Native American cultures, um, musical instruments. There are more, <laughs> um, but uh, moving forward, we're going to be uh, finishing out probably the, the third iteration of the quilt exhibit, and then we'll look to uh, bladesmithing for 2021. All right, let's see. Oh, hi, Liz. <laughs> How are you doing in Florida down there? Um, another question from Sharon. Was I a collector as a child? Ooh, <laughs> that, that is a good question. Um, I am sure my mom, who might be on here right now, will tell you I was definitely the little girl who played in mud puddles and filled her pockets with rocks so much that sometimes, um, the, my pants would slide down because my pockets were full of rocks or I'd make her carry some for me too. But yes, um, so you collect shells and crocheted snowflakes and corningware, all good collectibles. Um, yeah, my grandmother collected silver spoons, those little souvenir spoons and pitchers. And um, 
So now, yeah, I collect things now, like um, I collect pie birds and uh, I knit, so I have a large yarn collection, but I work hard um, to avoid any kind of ethical considerations. Um, as a, a curator at a museum, I would never um, collect anything that competes with the museum's collection. And, and that's, of course, very important. All right. So let's see. Any other questions? Uh, so what's one thing I wish people knew about McKissick? <laughs> hmm, another really good question. Um, I think uh, being a university museum in the state capitol, um, we are not the only museum in town. We're literally not the only game in town. And um, what I wish people knew about McKissick is, um, uh-oh. Uh, we're about to hear a dog bark a whole lot. <laughs> yes. <laughs> my apologies. <laughs> the mail is here and my dog the, <laughs> receives it through the mail slot. Um, so uh, the State Museum uh, is, of course, a very large museum in Colombia uh, with a very large collection as well. Um, they've been around since about the mid 80s. And um, occasionally uh, there's some confusion <laughs> between McKissick and the State Museum. Um, and I wish that uh, people knew um, a little bit more about the extensive history of McKissick's collection. Um, during the late 19th century, so late 1800s, early 1900s, um, there really weren't um, a whole lot of long-standing institutions in South Carolina, especially after the Civil War, that, that people had a lot of faith in um, their longevity, that they would be around for a long time. Uh, but the University of South Carolina was there and so a lot of um, a lot of people made donations to the University of South Carolina of things that they thought were important to the whole state. Um, remember, at the time, there was no state museum, and um, so South Carolina Library ended up receiving a lot of those collections, and it wasn't that was one of the primary reasons why McKissick Museum was started in the mid '70s was to um, find a, a home for a lot of the three-dimensional objects so that South Carolina could really focus on um, archives and two-dimensional objects. So um, while the museum, McKissick, has not been around for a hundred years, our collections have been at the institution, the university, for um, 100, 150, 200 years. So I think that's really important to, um, while we may be a relatively new museum, um, our collections date back a very, very long time. All right, so, hmm, any more questions coming? I am um, a couple more minutes. So I've got some more on my, my list here. Uh, oh, I love this one. What does a normal day look like? And, um, hmm, what does a normal day look like? I can't stop laughing. <laughs> um, I really don't have any normal days at all. <laughs> uh, I come into the museum and really focus on just seeing what's going on um, and putting out the biggest fire first. <laughs> We've been working hard on a grant funded digitization project. And so we are always um, kind of in the process of that, thinking about uh, different collections that are going to be included in this project right now. Um, again, the project is called the Historic Southern Naturalist. And I think I can probably share a, the website there. And I'll share it right to the browse page. So this is a link to the Historic Southern Naturalist project. Um, 
That's got uh, thousands and thousands <laughs> of uh, objects and records, um, all coordinated in a cross-referenced database. So what we did was we focused on um, three main naturalists, Thomas Cooper, Lewis Gibbs, and A.C. Moore, and we digitized or took um, images of all of the objects that they have all across the University of South Carolina. And then we've put all those images and records together online. And um, through funding from the Institute of Museum and Library Services, we were able to expand that project and um, include collections from the Charleston Museum and add more naturalists to it, um, which is the, the shell project that we're working on right now. So we're, we're getting pretty close to being at the end of the shell project and uh, we'll then start adding um, meteorites, some fossils from uh, early collectors here in South Carolina and, um, and then move on to a Lepidopteran collection or collection of moths and butterflies from the South. So um, that is one big project that we work on. Um, otherwise, I'm really constantly uh, trying to improve our database, add more records to it, um, clean up any, any other records. All right. Uh, so Linda has a question, what qualifies someone as a naturalist? Um, do you know any contemporary naturalists? Hmm. Well, um, when I first graduated from college, I went to Wyoming and I volunteered with a national monument out there called Fossil Butte National Monument. And I learned a lot about being a naturalist <laughs> and that it's, it's incredibly challenging because you've got to know a little bit or a lot about everything. Um, and in order to be a park ranger at a national park, I knew about fossils and I knew a little bit about other animals. I used to work for a veterinarian, so I know about anatomy, but I had to learn about grasses and wildflowers and the geology of the park where I was and the paleontologic history of that park, all the animals that had been um, discovered there. And the animals that could be found there now, like um, pronghorn antelope and moose. And, um, and it was in Wyoming and I'm from New Jersey. So I had to learn about a whole different kind of um, climate and ecosystem. So uh, being a naturalist is, is really knowing about the world around you and the environment around you. And one of the most I mean, if someone said, do you know of a naturalist right now? Of course, Rudy Mankey would pop to the um, the top of my head first. Absolutely. Um, and of course, Rudy would say that a naturalist is someone who um, knows about the world around them and is in awe of it. And so we've uh, always just again, trying to learn more about uh, the world around us and, and how our interactions um, shape that world and, and how, uh, how we, the world impacts us as well. Um, so the City of Florence Owls, hi. <laughs> um, thank you so much for your kind words. I hope you've uh, continued to enjoy visits to McKissick into the future. I hope we can get you back there pretty soon. All right, let me see what other, what's the weirdest thing you've seen at McKissick? Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> Goodness, maybe I'm becoming numb to weird things because <laughs> I'm at the point where nothing surprises me anymore. Um, when I first started as the curator of collections uh, just about two years ago, um, we had just finished a project to um, update the sprinkler system throughout the entire museum. And so in installation of this sprinkler system, the, the installers had to literally drill holes through the walls. And 
we hadn't had the opportunity to clean up any of this this dust um, in collection spaces. Of course, it was cleaned everywhere else. But so when I came on, I said, you know, like we got to clean. I want you know to just tidy everything up. And in doing that, we did find some really kind of weird stuff. I remember specifically in one collection space, um, Sadler and I found a broom that at some point had been burned. And I, we don't know, it didn't have any number on it, didn't have any notes with it. So maybe, maybe the burned up broom was one of the weirdest things that we came across. Um, I'm sure it won't be the last weird thing we come across in the collection. Oh, <laughs> one more thing. Um, McKissick has a collection of concretions which is um, kind of a, a natural geologic formation of grains of sand that are all kind of glued together. And we have a collection of concretions that are in the shapes of things like a bird's nest or a snake. And apparently um, the donor had submitted this collection of concretions to the state fair and they are blue ribbon award-winning concretions of strange things. Um, so uh, hopefully we'll be able to uh, get them online for you someday soon. But yes, the State Fair Blue Ribbon award-winning collection of weird concretions is definitely something strange. Uh, hmm. I think I have one more question here unless anybody wants to submit something else in the comments. Uh, what's the one thing you wish that you could display at McKissick, but you can't? Hmm. We have a jawbone of a whale. Um, it's a baleen whale, so it doesn't have big teeth in it, but it's um, probably 20 feet long. Um, it's currently in offsite storage and I would love to devise some kind of way to be able to exhibit that in a, maybe a future iteration of a natural history exhibit. We got to work a giant whale jaw into it, but um, that would be a, a nice thing to display. All right. Well, does anyone else have any other questions? If not, I want to thank you all for joining me and um, I hope you've enjoyed this uh, first Ask a Curator session. Uh, we'll be doing another one in a, a week or so with my colleague Lana Burgess. Um, she is a art historian and uh, teaches in the museum management program here. So at McKissick, uh, so maybe we can think of some, some interesting art questions for her. Hopefully she'll get a few of the same ones that I got and we'll get to see her perspective on what's the weirdest thing she ever saw at McKissick. So thank you again. I hope y'all stay safe and um, Keep uh, enjoying McKissick's Facebook posts. Uh, also, I'll post a couple of links here to our online collection database so you can uh, browse the collection yourself. We just updated it and we have close to 3000 objects on there that should keep everyone busy for a little while. All right, goodbye from Columbia. I hope you all stay safe and well. Signing off.